Okay. Let's see. So thank you very much for coming. It is my pleasure and my delight to share my passion with you. And so the journey that we're going to go on, this is the, the framework for it. And of course, it ends with the most important part, which is you. And before we get started, I want to assure you that I take data, privacy, ethics, sovereignty, and integrity very seriously. I spend a great deal of time with legal think tank people as well as regulators thinking through the issues around this, because I'm going to show you some things that might scare you. But I just want to assure you before we get started that I also think a lot about this and believe that we have to get the data issues solved for humanity to really take advantage of what I'm about to show you. So you ready? OK. So once upon a time, and I start with this because every good story starts with this. And so this is me. I was born, and then I went on to operate World of Warcraft China. Now, there might have been some other things in the middle, but I went from there to a meditation retreat. And something very interesting happened on that meditation retreat. I had what is called an awakening. And what that means is a profound shift in the way that I experienced reality. And specifically what that means is I had a decline in rumination. That's the technical term for the inner chatter, the voice in your head that says lots of things. And so it turns out that when you have a decline in rumination, you also become fearless. And it also turns out that when you become fearless, you also become happy. And the lower the noise, the greater the ability to connect with other people. And also, the lower the noise, the greater the ability to inhabit your purpose. And so this happened for me in 10 days. And I walked out, and I wanted this to be available, accessible, and affordable for all, which led to transformative technology. So transformative technology begins with the premise that the future of work society and the technology itself begins with the state of the human mind. And this question, how do we enable the mental and emotional and cognitive potential of every person? And this belief that we stand on the precipice of an unprecedented era of human flourishing where the technology that has taxed our thinking and even our relationships becomes able to help us have deeper connection, lower our fear, more compassion, and even joy. So transformative technology is technology for mental health, emotional well-being, and human thriving. And what's really exciting is that we can enable psychological well-being. Historically, this was considered a luxury, something that happened to you after a fear-filled and stress-filled life, but is no longer a luxury. It is actually a requirement for work, for life, and to thrive. And that's what I'm going to show you in this presentation. So what's happening all around the world is that people are struggling. And this is true across all countries, cultures, and cohorts. Everywhere, the psychological cost of stress and anxiety are rising. This is happening in China. It's happening in India. And one of the things, just in the United States, 90% of all of the current healthcare costs in the US are related to mental health or chronic illness. And then the chronic illness is driven by the things that you do when you are stressed. And then if you take it into another area, the future of work, the jobs of the future are all about human interaction, human beings solving problems together and being creative together. And so this top number, the number of jobs lost, 
by the rise in the automation line. If you look at the estimates, no one has any idea. The estimates are all over the place. The number that actually matters the most, though, is this one, the percentage of tasks. If you look at what the World Health Organization, I mean, what the World Economic Forum estimates will be the skills that are required for an AI era, as you can see when you look at these, these are all skills that you're better at when you have a calm and healthy mind. But the problem is this. We don't teach these skills in our society at scale. And those who have them really get them by luck. Your parents had them. You had a mentor who was good at it. But given the size of the need and the size of the requirement, there is a giant gap. Because we're moving from doing to being, being skills. And we're not very good at this. This is a comment from a woman who leads Fortune 500 for uh, innovation for a Fortune 500 company. And what she discovered to her surprise was that in order to get the work that she needed, she had to help her people find the very best of what was inside them, not only at work, but in their entire lives. And so also, if you add an environment of unprecedented technological change, it is the slowest it will ever be and the fastest it has ever been. But what's exciting is that these emerging technologies are all around us and we can leverage them, plus advances in neuroscience and behavioral science to develop new interventions. And so if you think of technology as the force that takes what is scarce and makes it abundant, then why not so too for the human mind? So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'd like to know how many people know that there was another level on top of self-actualization. How many people know that? Raise your hand. OK, great. So he studied this, self-transcendence. And essentially what this means is this is what happens when you understand that the self that you actualized, you no longer need. And so if you think about what you've seen with traditional discussions of technology, it's really on this level. But transformative technology says we can actually move up the triangle. And so this is the way that we see the world. This is the human psychological spectrum. And my vision and my hope is that we have a world where these are the basics. Mental health, emotional health, happiness, sleep, because you can't, be, you can't have well-being at all if you can't sleep and stress resilience, that these are trainable. Many people don't know that. They think that they're ephemeral. You can actually train for these. Then the future of work. It's all about human interaction, all about how we are with one another. And you all know from your own work lives that how we are with one another has everything to do with how you are with yourself. And then the last category, future human. What might we be? I'm very interested in things that expand and enhance mental and emotional capacity. These are the 12 areas of transformative technology that we look at. And all of my stuff is available online, so you can see it. And these are many of the ways, there's so many ways that you can actually pick up a signal and point at it with technology. Heart rate variability, galvanic skin response. This is from the TransTech 200, where we looked at 200 companies. And this is the way that they were mediating these signals. Because one of the things that you should know is that your inner landscape is, in fact, knowable. Human emotion is actually now data. And this is accelerating in its precision. People are starting to be able to get to blended emotion. That means you seem like you're angry, but you're actually sad. And so since all of this is on exponential curves, it's going to get better. This is an AI that was trained in 2016 on 5,000 hours of sitcoms. And it was able to predict, after watching those 5,000 hours, 
30 seconds in advance what groups of humans would do. So even group behavior is also data. And so with all these signals and all of these pieces of technology, I find this to be a very useful framework. Assess, amplify, enhance, and connect. And this is what transformative technologies can do. So assessment power. Facebook knows a lot about you. Imagine if you knew as much about yourself. Why should the ad sellers be the only ones who have that level of understanding? And imagine what you might do if you had that depth of understanding about yourself. Now the UI UX on this is not, and the products are not completely in place, but the assessment power of these technologies, provided that you have the data privacy, ethics, and sovereignty, could be very useful to us. The second category is amplification. And so this is Gary Kasparov, the grand chess master. And he's actually one of the people that I admire the most. And I admire the, him the most, not because of the way that he won, but because of the way that he lost. Because when he lost to Deep Blue, he went on to study everything he could about AI and develop a new category of chess called advanced freestyle. Because he began with this question, what if I could play with a computer at my side, with the human skills combined with a computer? Could it be the most perfect game ever? And the answer is yes, because at this point, when humans play AI in chess, the AI wins. But when humans and AI play as a unit, the human AI unit beats the AI. So this is the model, this amplified model, centaur chess. Think of all of the talented humans that you know, the talented teachers and the therapists and the mentors, and what might this do for the ability for these humans to support and interact with more. Enhancement. I love this because human beings love feedback. Gravity is a feedback mechanism. That's how you learn to walk. And understanding is a feedback mechanism, and that's how you learn to communicate. And so what this does, this is a little game that does heart rate variability and the way, and it, so it goes on your ear and it uh, judges the rate of your heart, which is a good proxy for psychological state. And so what it does is kids play the game and their spells are more powerful based on how fast they can drop their heart rate. And so what that means is before the exam or at the winning, you know, the last goal for the winning game, when a child is flustered they already know how to use their physiology to control their psychology. So this is a good example of that. Um, how many people are married? Raise your hand if you're married. Yeah, okay, so what these are is these are rings that are connected to the internet and wherever you are in the world, it broadcasts your heartbeat to the person who has the other ring. And the reason why I love this is because when people think about technology, they do not think about intimacy connection. And I also love, because you know I want to be a superhero in my mind, um, I love the idea of us getting additional senses. So what this creates is a visceral feeling of the person that you love. And yes, it's better to be there in person, but when you are not, this is amazing. So now I'm going to show you a bunch of different products across a lot of categories. And the reason why I'm doing it is just so you, you understand that this is happening. So people are doing things with sleep and meditation and, of course, emotion recognition. Um, they're doing it with mood management and focus and behavior change. And then the HRV that I, I mentioned to you. Uh, VR, AR, we've seen some amazing products here and projects. And pattern recognition, which I'll give you a detailed example on. One of the things that many people didn't know is that at the beginning of 2017, one of the top commands to Alexa, it was in the top third, so it's 2017, was Alexa, help me relax. And so if you go home and you ask her that, she is a font of information about what to do with that. But if you think about other things and the 
prevalence of intelligent assistance in our lives, why not use AI to challenge meaning making, the stories that we tell ourselves? It's very interesting. Here's some other categories. You guys heard from Nenea yesterday with TRIP. I'm very interested in gut biome. Now, this is not at the level of causation, but there is an interesting correlation that people who have depression also have disturbed gut biomes. So if this does come together, this means that we could treat depression potentially with engineered probiotics and get people off of the traditional molecules. So very interesting. This is an example that I want to share with you to describe the spectrum and the power in this category. So this is a product that was developed by Tom Insel, who used to be the head of the National Institute of Mental Health. He went from there to Verily, which is a Google company, and then left Verily to do this. This is digital phenotyping. And basically what that means is monitoring, with permission, the way that you use your phone. Not what you say, not who you say it to, but the way that you use the keyboard the way that you hold the phone, the digital phenotype of how you use the technology can give insight and predictive ability about whether or not someone who is challenged with depression is going to have a depressive episode. And so what they are doing is they are showing that they can decrease cost of care between $100 to $300 a month. So they work with providers. They also have an amplified model where when someone appears to be able to have, about to approach a depressive episode, a human being gets in touch with them. But the important thing to realize with this is that the same understanding for what for many people is their worst period of time ever is also for your best day ever. It's really, it's the same continuum of understanding. And so what's interesting about this product category is that every investment across the psychological spectrum for every use case, if you invest in human optimization, you're actually also investing in future basics. And that's really hopeful because there's a lot of people who need help. This is the Transformative Tech 200. It was a market map that we did in 2017, and I'm about to redo it. Um, and so this was only 200 companies. Since 2017, the explosion of activity in this space, partly due to the decrease in stigma, as well as a lot of other things, uh, we'll be putting that market map out shortly. But this is to show you there is a there there. And people need it and want it. The rising generation all around the world wants to be happy. They use a lot of wearables. They now believe that reaching out for help is a sign of strength. And so the market is actually ready and wanting things. And this is an interesting quote. This was for the MIT edition that uh, Bill Gates did guest curation on. And, and I love this one. The brilliant minds of the future We'll focus on metaphysical questions. How do we create a meaningful connections? How do we help everyone live a fulfilling life? And so the thing to really know is what's different about this time versus any other is that for the first time in human history, need, demand, and means have come together. And that's important to know because you must have all three to make a market. And without all three, you cannot make the market. But all three are here, now. And so this is what we do. At the Transformative Technology Lab, we're the largest ecosystem that supports people who make transformative technologies. We work with entrepreneurs and innovators who are building tech, these types of technologies, and we help them find feedback funding and friends. And we're in 70 countries and 450 cities, all over the world, people want to make this technology. And this is our goal, to reach 2 billion people by 2050 to help them enter a state of flourishing. And this number is not random. It's based on a study that was done by the University of Pennsylvania, 
where they looked at what percentage of a population online is required to start a revolution. And so they set up hundreds of communities and did a variety of incentive things to see. And so world population 2050, depending on the estimate, is about eight and a half billion. And so, so it's a little dirty, this number, but what's exciting is that in the aggregation of all the products and all the services, we actually only have to reach two billion people to change the world. That's all it takes to start a revolution, right? But even though that's very exciting, success is not a certainty. And we are running out of time a little bit because what's required is when the automation line rises, it's gonna rise very quickly. And that's when you're going to see massive destabilization of the current tasks. And so right now we're in a situation where we have an educational system that does not teach people what they need. And we have a medical system that does not teach people how to be healthy. And we have a cognition crisis and an attention crisis. And we have a variety of things that are working against us, rising stress, anxiety, and depression all around the world. And then, if you think, if you look at the technology or you read the paper and you think, how might I protect myself? What do I do? One of my favorite authors is Yuval Harari, and your very best thing, the best thing you can do, oldest advice in the book, know yourself. And one of my other favorite authors is Umar Haik, who's an economist in London. And in a world, of, his quote is this bottom one, in a world of constant change, the only solid ground is going to be your sense of purpose which is very interesting because this guy, when asked about the automation effect, he actually said, I'm not really that worried about that one in comparison to the purpose problem for humanity. Who are we? What, what is acceptable? What do we believe is acceptable? And so I think the, the fundamental problem that we're seeing is that all of our technology is on exponential curves. And our existential crises are also on exponential curves. And so this is climate change, income inequality. But human growth and development is still linear, and in many cases, analog. And so I think what we're seeing in the world, in the crisis of consciousness, is that fundamentally, we do not know how to be, and we don't know how to feel, and we don't know how to become. And all of the things that used to tell us that, if you look at the Tr Edelman Trust Index, all around the world, people no longer believe in the things that they used to believe in to the extent that they used to believe in them. So we are awash, and we don't know who we are, and we don't know where we're going. And so one of the things that I would point out for those of you who do know your purpose is that partially it came from these three things. Who, what I think and what I say about myself and also what I think about what other people think and say. What my body says and what I actually do, what my behavior says. And so these two things are approachable with technology today, just the things that I've shown you. And this top one will be soon. And the reason why that matters for everything is that in order to answer who are we, in order for you to fully contribute to that conversation, you must answer the question, who am I? They're tied. And so I call this the faster train. And so what that means is that we must get on the faster train. We must use the technologies that we can to get human growth and development on the same curves that our technology and our crisis are on. And so how many people know about the 
ikigai. This is pretty common, right? So what I love about it is the Japanese belief about a reason for being. And what's wonderful here is it's like that your reason for being, your purpose, is a combination of what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, what you're good at. So your passion, your mission, your vocation, your profession is in here. And then I've combined it with this concept of the kairos, which is what the world needs, the change at the exact right moment, what can happen. And so many of the things that I've shown you already get at this. And so my point is that we can use the technology to support us in understanding what our purpose is and that that is essential to understanding who we are so we can decide who we want to be. And so the way that it ties to games, I love Jane McGonigal's point that some things are just better in games. There's many things that games just do better. And so if reality is broken, and life very much is like an RPG, if you think about it, you take your avatar on a journey, and you acquire skills and gear and friends and abilities. Now, this only is until level 80, you know, so that's a little disappointing, right? But, and everyone here is most likely going to live to 100, and your children will live to 150. But the in-game part is the part where you can do what you want, where you want, with who you want, how you want, that you have the skills and the abilities to do so. And so, if you think about when people talk about the metaverse, it typically ends where the pixels do. And then you have the augmented verse, which brings the digital into the physical. But then what I propose to you is that the world is the map. And you are your high level character. So this is a friend of mine. His name is Jesse Elder. And he is a coach. And he helps people find their, their passion. And so, you know, I am deeply informed by World of Warcraft because I spent so, time, so much time on the back end of that game. But if you think about actually how difficult it is to navigate the map in the real world, as you know, these are skill trees. And if you think that the future of learning education, careers, is actually a series of developmental experiences, then potentially games can help us understand who we are. All games, the current games, the future games, who are we? And so this I took from Mary Meekers. The first part is her map. And so this is, you know, the changes that have happened. This is what's happening right now. But this, this is coming. Everything is going to have a game interface. This is the future. And so if you think about these numbers and you add in your abilities, your visions, your desires, your ambitions for what you'd like to build. You're how we get to this number. Certainly part of it. And so what's really required is we must build the technology that we actually really need. Out in the Bay, I say no more champagne delivery apps. Like, we don't need that. We need the technology that helps us understand who we are. So I would say to you, one takeaway, build mirrors within what you're building already. Show people how they've played. Help them understand who they are so that we can know ourselves better than the algorithms. This is how the algorithms stay our servants and don't become our masters, so that we have better access to our inner landscape. Takeaway number two, we make this stuff. A lot of times there's a little bit of a tech lash and a little bit of a defeatism, I think, around the games, I mean, around technology. And, but people forget we're the designers. And so 
you can insist in your design framework that two humans must meet in, in, you know, together, or they must meet online. You can make the design space include both digital, digital and physical, because the reality is that it's already one world. And the insistence that they are separate is keeping people from doing great design about how we properly bring them together. Takeaway number three, what I've seen is that your level of consciousness shows up in the tech. And so what that means, you can certainly build things that are worse than you are. You know, I mean, we've all had short timelines, short staff, that kind of thing. But what I have seen is that you cannot build something that is better than you are. So if you want to change the world, one of the most important things for you to do is to focus seriously on your own mental and emotional, and maybe even spiritual, defined as who am I, development. Because who you are, your level of consciousness is going to show up in what you build. And it will be your upper limit. And then the very last point is that there is no more nobler use for technology than to bring peace to the minds of humankind. And this is the great work. This is the great work of our time. Thank you.